Okay, so today's video, we're gonna go through how to troubleshoot any case. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually kind of go to a list I made. You can screenshot the list or write it down or whatever you wanna do. And then we're gonna go bounce from the list to a real hands-on, to the pen and paper, to the list, to the real hands-on, to the pen and paper. But I promise you, if you watch it all and stick around, you'll learn a thing or two about a thing or two. So really quick, I wanted to make a video on troubleshooting. How to troubleshoot 99% of cases, um, or at least find the root cause of 99% of cases. So now this is not like an intricate, like I can't show you how to necessarily troubleshoot every valve or troubleshoot whatever, but this is kind of an overview with 15 steps that if you follow this list, you'll for the most part, a 99, you know, 90% of cases, find what the issue is. Now, um, my, I'm gonna, first off, it's gonna start off with this list. I'm gonna explain the list, and then we're gonna go to the pen and paper, and then after the pen and paper, and I'm gonna explain why I implemented each step in this list, we're then gonna go to the hands-on, we're gonna watch the video. Now the video is not one for one with my list and the pen and paper. Like I don't go through all 15 points in the video, um, I, in, in the actual hands-on portion, I maybe, go through like all of the major points on the list you know like I go through the major steps because I didn't create this video having this video of explaining how to troubleshoot in the generic sense in mind I, I made the video because I, I was hoping to find an issue I thought the TXB screen was clogged I thought it'd be good to show uh, good to show a troubleshooting process but I found out I was wrong I actually ends up it was a temperature probe and I forgot to verify that the temperature probe was was right. I didn't do step two, which actually led me to basically waste probably 35, 40 minutes of my time to only arrive at step two in the end. Um, so I thought it'd be a good lesson to kind of show like this is why we follow it. And uh, uh, fortunately, I made it through almost all the steps in the video. So we'll be able to see most of it. Now, it's not one for one. My rules of thumb in the actual um hands-on part are a little bit different. The reason that is, is like I said, I wasn't intending the video to be this, but I realized it could become this. And this is a video I've been trying to make for a while. Um, you know, if I'm honest, you know, I I have a wife, you know, I have kids, you know, I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> got a lot going on in my life. I got three kids, a wife, full-time job. And you know, my boss says I'm not allowed to take time away from my job to do the videos. So if I do do them, they have to be on my lunch or they have to be, you know, with my work without slowing down my work, you know, which is 100% fair. Uh, so it's taken me a bit to edit this and put this together. But so that's kind of why the rules of thumb are a little different and maybe the order of the steps might be slightly different, but I edited it. Um, all the same to be as close as possible to complement one another. Maybe at some point I'll release a really good one which is step by step, everything all linked up together. But in my short time alive, I have realized that perfect is the enemy of the good. So this is the best I got for you. I hope it helps you. Uh, without further ado, let's get started. All right, let's just run through this really quick. So first up is airflow. Obviously go to your case and make sure you have proper airflow with the fans running. Is the honeycomb plugged? Is the coil iced up? Next up, you got temperature probe. Okay, verify in a cup of ice water. You know, you're, if you make the assumption the temperature probe's working, that's what happened to me. Main assumption, don't make an assumption. Okay, just put in a cup of ice water, make sure it's around 33 degrees. Okay, is the controller calling for refrigeration? Okay, this is what I would say is kind of a next step. It's supposed to be done in unison with step four, right? And so while you go up there, you're gonna check and uh, make sure that, you know, you, you know, your rack pressures are correct. While you're there, just go into the case in the controller, make sure that the controller's calling for refrigeration and that no one has overrided it. Now, I neglected to do this in the video, but I think it's a fair thing to mention because so many times I go to stores, you know, and I get calls to these places, and the previous technician just simply forgot to take out an override. All right, he, he replaced EVAP coil or a valve or something. He turned it off for some reason, and he just forgot to replace it or she, or whatever, you know. And so I thought that that's a, 
fair point to bring up. Make sure it's actually calling for refrigeration and that it's calling properly. Next up, you know, obviously check your rash pressures, your discharge, and your suction. Just do it at the controller. Unless you have a probable cause, I don't see any reason in needing to gauge up unless maybe if like for instance if it's a if it's a condensing unit or a small system, you have to gauge up. They're not gonna have pressure transducers on those, more than likely. Um, but for the most part, you know, just you know, check it on the controller. This is meant to be a quick kind of list, you know, to get you through. Um, so check it on the controller, uh, super quick, and you'll see you'll see how I do that. And then next up, next up is uh, check your rack safeties and check uh, your condenser. So these things are again meant to kind of be together in tangent. Now more than likely, if you step four, your rack pressures. More than likely, if your rack pressures are fine, uh, steps four and five are going to be fine as well because usually your rack pressures are an indication of it but it's still worth checking out because sometimes you know like it's a hot day let's say and um, you know it's just literally might be one compressor is off on an oil safety and that is what is causing your system to not have quite as much pep as it needs to get to where it needs to go. I remember one time I was in a store and I was troubleshooting a case like crazy, trying to figure out what was up with it, trying to figure out what was wrong with it. And um, I couldn't for the life of me figure it out. Every, every test was passed, but I never made sure to check if the condenser ha had all the motors on it. And one of the condenser fan motors were out. There's only four on the condenser and it was like a 90 degree day. The head pressure was like 350. And I probably should have caught that down over here, but on a lot of the providers that we service, they they don't really get new condensers, so the condensers all run at very, very, very high temperatures. So it just didn't cross my mind, but if I checked out the condenser and checked if it was plugged, I would have noticed one, you know, one of the motors were down and I would have looked at the pressures and kind of made the connection and said, hey, I think that until we get this, you know, condensing temperature down, until we get this pressure down, I don't think the case is going to pull temp as quickly as it should to, to beat the alarm system that's in place. And I would have caught that if I not only checked the pressures, but if I also checked these safeties as well, and as well as if I checked this condenser. So you'll see me go through that in the video as well. And then, um, so next up is receiver level. So low refrigerant is literally like probably one of the number one causes of um, service calls, uh, leaks and leak repair. That's like the number one thing. So receiver level is super important. Now, when I was a wee little technician, I used to think that I could get away with just looking at the sight glass alone. You can't. Okay, you have to look at the receiver level. If your receiver levels is absolutely zero and your sight glass is flashing, there's a 99% chance you need gas in your system. Now I put these rules of thumb here, rule of thumb during the summer, 20%, and I put this note here that 20% is at about 70 degrees, okay? And then the winter time is about 80%, okay? That is like the sweet spot for most racks, but, okay, above zero is probably okay. So if you're like looking at a case and you're like, is it because I'm low on refrigerant? Well, if the receiver is 1%, even just 1%, and then your sight glass is clear, more than likely it's not your refrigerant level. We service a lot of stores that they like to run um, the receiver level basically at zero. And even in all honesty, if you look at the receiver gauge, you have like a zero right there. The, the needle is literally just below zero, but it's not straight down, and that's how they like to run it. Just as close to nothing as possible, and the systems work fine. So basically, as long as you're not at absolutely zero, and your sight glass is clear, you don't have low refrigerant. Now next up is your rack filter dryer. Now this is part of that whole like trifecta there. So these three are all meant to kind of be put together and thought of together as you're checking because for instance if you have a receiver level of, let's say you know 50 percent right there right you, you got a big receiver level okay and and your sight glass is flashing okay then there's actually 
like a probability that your rack filter dryer might be clogged. Because what would happen is now it's actually preventing your refrigerant from flowing out of your receiver, which causes your receiver level to rise. Now, this isn't always the case because sometimes your sight glass can flash on low load days or high load days or or sometimes it can do those things and sometimes your receiver level might be zero but your sight glass is clear because the load is so high. So it's not like a guaranteed thing but it still could be an indicator, okay? And that's why we just check the rack filter dryer with the pressure differential, okay? And so if you receive uh, across your rack filter dryer. Now, if your receiver has refrigerant in it, so let's say, you know, above zero, okay, and then you have a pressure differential across your rack filter dryer, more than likely your rack filter dryer needs to be changed. Now, could this be causing the issue with your case? It could be, and that's why it's on here. I remember I was working at a store with a 37 PSI differential across the filter dryer. I don't know if it's ever been changed. It was insane. I changed it and almost all the cases in the store started pulling temp. So it's pretty wild. Next up, we have the rack circuit ball valves, okay? So these are the ball valves on your on your rack, okay? Just to make sure that they're open. I thought of this after I rewatched my video a couple times. Um, again, technicians will always, very often times, they'll close things down, turn things off, just always make sure they're open. Just a quick check, yep, my ball valves are open. Next up is the liquid line solenoid, suction line, or EPR. So you're going to have some type of um, activation device, some type of device that your controller communicates with that says refrigeration on. You have to check that that device whether it's a liquid line solenoid, suction solenoid, or EPR, or I've also seen it where it's a liquid line and an EPR working together, you have to make sure that that system is communicating to that and that that is feeding properly. So in this case, it was a CDS valve, which is an electronic EPR. We checked that in the video. Next up is pressure at the cases. So you need to look at your pressure at the cases, okay? Like, and a rule of thumb for the suction pressure is, you know, does it match the case spec? Obviously is what you're looking for. And then rule of thumb for the evaporator temperature is about 10 below um, the core, your desired case temperature. So if you're looking at your suction, if your evap coil is, uh, is 22 degrees, your case will be around 32. That is the rule of thumb. Oh, I added it to it quick. Is the liquid 100 PSI above the suction, right? So we know what we're looking for for the suction temperature is to meet the desired case and the spec, and we'll see me find that in the video. But now the other side is, is the liquid at least 100 PSI above the suction? I actually don't look at that in the video, but it's good practice to do so. Next, well, in the, in the not the video, but the, the hands-on section. Next up, case hand valves. Are, is the hand valves open? I've gone to many cases. I see a nice shiny new TXV, but the case isn't working still. The technician forgot to turn on the hand valve, okay? Super common, more common than you think. Even coil cleaning companies will come in, clean coils, and they'll shut down the cases with the hand valve, okay? And they will forget it. Then we get a service call and go in there. Hand valve's important. Next up is the case filter dryer. So all you do is you take a temperature differential across it, five to six degrees rule of thumb. Okay, in my video, I think I say three to four. It's really to taste, whatever you, for me, I might on some days, I might be more active on a three to three to four degree system. And then on other days, I might be like, yeah, five to six is where I'm looking at, depending on how I feel the system, just on experience, just as you get to learn the systems more. But I would say five to six is a more solid, um, rule of thumb. Now superheat is the last one. And after you check everything else, now you're checking superheat. Does the superheat match the case spec? Is is the case is it case close to temp? Because if your case is so far out of temperature, your superheat's gonna automatically kind of not be correct. Is the TXV screen clean? And uh you know test the TXV is kind of your your last thing. Now superheat could also mean any kind of metering device, okay? So this could be capillary tubes, an EEV, um, all those kinds. Now, 
Now we're going to get into, um, I'm going to go to a pen and paper now, and I'm going to explain why all these steps are in the order that they're in the order. Okay, now if you want this list, you can screenshot as I go, or I am going to post it in the description below. Feel free to copy to it, add to it, you know, do whatever you got to do. Make yourself a better technician, okay? And now we're going to go over to the pen and paper, and I'm going to, again, do a rough outline of this uh, with the pen and paper. I think on the pen and paper, I might not talk about the, like, the verifying the valve steps, but, you know, we'll go through that quick. And then we'll go to the practical aspect, the actual hands-on. And then I'll come back here and just close out with a couple closing remarks. And hopefully you'll learn a thing or two about a thing or two. So we're going to do an overview of why I wrote my list the way that I wrote it. So first off, you got to start off with airflow. So why do you start off with airflow? Well, because it can eliminate all kinds of things immediately off the bat. If you have airflow, then you know it's not a defrosting issue. Okay, if it was a defrosting issue, that's a whole nother way of approaching the system. Also, you 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 just need airflow to make sure your system functions. Like, it doesn't matter if everything else is green lighted, if there's no airflow, then your case is never gonna pull temperature. So first, verifying that will save you a whole lot of work around in, from the get-go. Second off, temperature probe. Why do you do your temperature probe? Is because you have an assumption. The assumption is, my case is running warm. And until you verify that temperature probe, you don't know that for a fact. You just assume that that's true. So you can't move forward. So if you pass the airflow test and the airflow is fine, and then you go to your temperature probe and you're like, I, I, I'm just gonna assume it's working. No, you need to check it. Cause now you go, my airflow is okay, but I do really actually have a problem. Then you can move on to your next thing. Before we can go up and then check the other stuff at the rack, while we're at the controller, I just want to interject this. We have to check and make sure that the controller is calling for refrigeration to begin with. So typically what would happen is the controller would send voltage to an EPR or a suction line solenoid or something in order to get the system flowing. So we want to make sure that the actual computer says, yes, I am trying to refrigerate before we move to the next step and troubleshoot because we need to know that. So for instance, there could be offsets put in, there could be manual overrides put in or left in that technicians have done before and we have to verify that quickly before we can move on. Which is your pressures, your discharge and your suction pressure. Now, if your rack is not working properly, okay, you can't troubleshoot your case. Why? Because you're gonna get weird stuff happening down here. For instance, if your suction pressure is not right at your rack, your suction pressure is not going to be right at your case. And if you focus on the case first, you might think it's an EPR, when in reality it's because your press compressors are off on safety. Or if you know, you're know you not flowing, you don't have high enough head pressure or something, you're not flowing refrigerant properly, you might think it's the filter dryer. Because if you're not flowing refrigerant properly, right, you can actually get a, a temperature difference across this filter dryer or a pressure differential across this filter dryer just because there's not a high enough pressure from the rack. So your case will actually show you, oh, I have all this stuff going wrong with me, right? But in reality, it's fine. It's just you haven't addressed your rack yet. So after we do the pressures, you know, we checked our safeties, right? Just make sure to keep it in the back of your mind, as I mentioned, that your safeties are okay, that your compressors are running, and then your condenser fans are not plugged. Now, from there, what do we do? Receiver level. What receiver level do we have? Why do we check receiver level? Because it's going to tell us a couple things. So receiver level and then sight glass. So if the receiver level is below zero, like absolute zero, like down all the way, and the sight glass is flashing, you're low on refrigerant. But let's say your, refri your receiver level is 20% or 50%, but your sight glass is still flashing, then it, it's actually very possible that it could be your rack filter dryer. That's why those are the next three steps. Is because, so that's a telltale sign that it's a rack filter dryer and it's restricting flow. But now, if you, your receiver level is 20%, your sight glass is clear, and you have no pressure differential across your filter dryer, you know that, okay, my pressures are right, my refrigerant route level is right. Okay, so now all of this is greenlit. Now, there is a slight caveat here, kind of difficult, but sometimes your sight glass will still flash in the winterish months 
because there's not a high enough load and there's not enough flow. So you'll still have a receiver level, you'll have no pressure differential, and you might have a sight glass that flashes and then disappears and then flashes and then sometimes that happens, but not super common. But general rule, receiver level, clear sight glass, you know, no pressure differential across the filter dryer. So now we know our pressures are right, our flow is right, at least to here, right? And now, what do we look at? Well, we're going to look at our, before we go to the EPR, the suction line solenoid and those type of devices, those activation devices, uh, check your ball valves for your circuit. So you're going to have these two ball valves at the rack, make sure they're open. Our EPRs and our solenoid valves. So if we had a, a liquid line solenoid, it would be on this side. And if we had an EPR, it would be on this side. And sometimes we have both. Now we have to make sure, right? Are we getting flow to the case? Are we getting flow to the case? You have to make sure everything's green lit. So we know pressures are right, flow all the way up to this point is fine. So now we have to check, is this EPR, at least in the case in the example that I give, the CDS valve, is it having a proper opening and closing and metering of refrigerant, which would allow flow through the system? And I confirm that yes, it did. So now from there, we know that the EPR is working, right? So there should be proper flow. So now we... Ch All right, next up, before we go to the filter dryer, just interjecting this into the video because I got ahead of myself in the video. We got to check the pressures at the rack and then the filter dryer. But but actually even before that, we have to check the hand valves. So th this step is kind of all done in conjunction. Filter dryer pressures and hand valves are all kind of done together in, in a way. But in my opinion, hand valves... So pressure, hand valve, and then filter dryer is, is the linear order. I think I put my in my list like that because, for instance, if you check the pressures, let's say there's a pressure tap after this filter dryer, and you finding, like, you know, you got 180 on one side, and then the other side you got, like, 120, okay? That could be a very telltale sign, additional information to your temperature differential across the filter dryer, that that filter dryer could be bad. Also, you want to check your case pressure in respect to your specification. You can see me do it in the video where I actually look at the Hill Phoenix specs and I see that the case is meant to be a 27 degree evap coil. And when I checked it, it's a, you know, it, it works out perfectly to a 27 degree evap coil. It's holding pressure perfect, perfectly. And why would you want to press, check the pressure here at the case when you already checked the pressure up at the rack? Well, I actually dealt with a call that they added another case on, on a circuit when the line set was too small. And so that line set had a pressure rise, you know, um, all the way over here. So right before the rack, the pressure was like 18, but actually at the case, the pressure was like 26. Why? Because the line size was not sized properly, causing this pressure differential, causing the case to run warm. So we actually had to lower the entire suction group of the rack. So it's very important that you check the pressures here, make sure they're proper, then you check the hand valve, and then you check the filter dryer. And now I'm going to go into what I was going to say about the filter dryer before. Check this filter dryer, because this is the next thing in the lineup that would impede flow of refrigerant to your system. So we check the temperature differential across this case filter dryer. Okay, if that's all good, the only thing left, right? Pressures are right, refrigerant level is right, flow is right, okay? EPR is feeding, or suction solenoid is feeding, okay? Everything is feeding to the what? The TXV. This is the only thing remaining at that point. And how do you test it? Superheat. Okay, you test your superheat. Is your superheat right? No. Why? Is it your sensing bulb? Is it your screens clogged? Okay. Is it that your TXV maybe isn't set right? Is it that your TXV, you need a new one, your body's warped, right? Those are a separate video on how to troubleshoot those things individually, but at least this list will get you to the root of your problem of your case. Now, in the example I give, again, as I mentioned, I go through this whole thing, but I made an assumption that the temperature was okay. So you'll actually see me get to this TXV step and I, I'm still trying to justify. I'm still like, I'm convinced that it's, it's TXV screen. 
but it's not. It's the temperature probe. All right, so now we're going to go to the hands-on, and I might interject a little bit of pen and paper, you know, as we're going through it, but we're going to go to the hands-on, going to go through it, and then I'll kind of wrap it up in the end with, you know, thanks and all that good stuff, and hopefully you'll kind of get, okay, this is how you do each thing. This is how I checked it in a quick way, and hopefully you find this beneficial. Okay, today we got a dairy case running wrong. Let's kind of figure it out. So if we look at every single day this case, uh, FO4, temp 1, temp 1, temp 1, temp 1, temp 1, temp 1, it always goes in alarm then comes out. So we're going to go over to expand info, F4, right, we're going to take a quick look and we're just going to kind of see. So, you know, it's in alarm for like 10 minutes, not a big deal. Limit exceeded 41, 41.11, well that's kind of lame, right? So it's not really doing very much, but it's temperature T1. Alright, so we're just going to step out of here. And uh, we're gonna go down, and actually, we're gonna go. We're gonna go back to the home screen now. We're gonna hit that home button right there. Now we're at the home screen, and then we're gonna go hit circuits with this F3. This is the Emerson controller here. Using this today, and uh, we're just gonna kind of look down. So page down, page down, page down. There we go. And we're going to look at this F4 right there. It's in defrost now. Of course it's in defrost. Why would it not be, right? But you can see that it has one, two, three, four case, um, four case uh, temperature probes in it. So we're going to just kind of go down here. And now we're going to look at a refrigeration map. We're going to find where it is. So if we look at it, it's in this dairy aisle right there, F4, T1, T2, T3, T4. So the case that we're concerned with is the one that's closest to this lineup of other cases in the corner. So we're going to take a look at that fo 4 t one First thing we do is we just get some coffee. So if I can impart anything on you, it's a pot of coffee a day keeps the exhaustion at bay. Anyway, anyway, so first thing is we're just going to check airflow, see how it's doing. Okay, it seems like a little weak, but could just be the refrigeration we're also going to check our these are what i would call them reference thermometers so uh these are not gospel truth they're just a tool to be used okay so about 42 about 42 okay so we're gonna check the fans quick so airflow is of course number one you always start with airflow it seems like this is actually fine um i'm just gonna turn my light on to verify that last one all of them spinning. Airflow is okay. I might lift up that last tile to double check. Also, while you're checking your airflow, you want to be taking stock of things you have. We have a TXV screen. We also have an inline screen. Okay, instead of a filter dryer. All right, there's no filter dryer down there, but I'm still going to check the other side just in case. And we have a hand valve. So while I'm here, I almost always just check the hand valve because, believe it or not, technicians leaving hand valves off or some stores hire cleaning companies to clean their cases is super common. So I'm going to move on and check that other fan and then we're going to move up to the rack. So the fan right there was okay. So now I'm going to come over here. I'm just going to make sure the honeycomb isn't plugged. Now I have a video out there that I found a, a plugged honeycomb. You can take a look with these um, medium temp cases. Plugged honeycombs are super duper common. So this one looks like I'm going to have to undo a couple screws. So I'm going to do that and then check the honeycomb. Yeah, so you can see this is good. This is good to go. Um, seems to be fine. You can also take a light and uh, spray a light in it as well. I'm going to do that as well. But I also just like to physically check, you know, and see it as well. But I'm going to take this light, spray it in it on top of it. So we just take a look. And that looks okay. So... This store I'm working in, so other stores I might be more picky and take the whole thing down. But this store that I'm working in is actually historically very, very clean, very put together. So by looking at that one, that one looks pretty good. I can actually feel the airflow coming through pretty decently. I think it's something to do with feeding refrigerant. But anyway, we're just gonna go and look up top. All right, so just really quick, we're at home. So you can see from here, we're gonna go to circuits, F3. Okay, it's gonna give it a minute, pulls it up, page down, we're gonna go to our F04, click right there, and we're gonna look 
and uh, oh no that's PF my bad we're gonna hit the stairs to go back one what's one up do 40 feet of dairy currently at 32 but we're gonna check on it we're gonna see our temp one is still you know three degrees warmer than all the others so you know we're gonna go take a look at everything and try to find what's that attached to on the roof I think I, mean, I have a theory that it's attached to rack B, but there's a lot of self, uh, a lot of single condensing units on the roof, so we'll just see what that's attached to. See if we can find anything. A lot of the stores you guys see me work on, right? They have one giant rack for the whole store, or two racks for the whole store. This store is a bit different, okay? It'll actually have, it usually has two racks, a, a medium temp and a low temp. And then it'll actually have a bunch of these single condensing units, like that one over there, probably for the grocery freezer. You can see that one, two, three, four, just in that vicinity. So sometimes, you know, when a case is B1, it's on rack B. When a case is A1, it's on rack A. You know, it's not rocket science here, but every once in a while you get these Fs and stuff, and depending on the store, there might be its own you know system now you can see right here it looks like there's a loop system that they put in here I have to verify that fo4 right that's the way that they label this fo2 fo1 so sometimes what happening happens is so this is rack b so we're just going to check all the pressures on rack b and how rack b is doing and um but sometimes what happens is stores they when they're engineered initially they have all these bright ideas. We're going to label cases B's and F's and whatever they want to do. You know, all these fancy goals and aspirations. And then they realize we should have just named all of them B, you know, or all of them F, you know, or it should have been Rack F and not had circuits that are Rack F or something. Anyway, so they'll retroactively change it. And sometimes you can find that in the machine rooms, but you got to kind of you know, every store is going to have a different architecture. So anyway, I found that it's rack B, so we're going to look into it. So we're at the home screen on this Emerson system. So I'm going to hit F1 for suction. Emerson E2 controller. And we have rack B, which is, uh, oh, rack B. And then it looks like suction group F. That's why it's labeled F. We have a suction group F on rack B. The suction target is 57. It's currently 57. So that seems like that's fine. Currently, so we're gonna back up. Now we're gonna to go to our condenser. Okay, condenser A B, condenser A A C F. So, you know, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be A A C F because I think it was like a labeling change. But we can just check to see if both condensers they're both where they want to be for temperature. So now we're gonna get up on the roof again. And we're going to go and we're going to check the refrigerant level. I do all this because it's a linear process. I might recommend to you guys, you know, as you watch my channel and other channels or whatever you do to learn, talk to your elders, your, your you know, your refrigeration dogs, been doing it for years, develop a procedure and stick to it. A to B to C to D, okay? Develop it. Airflow, you know, refrigerant level filter dryer at the rack you know safeties for compressor you know for compressors you know whatever happens to be you know work your way down in case filter dryer in case screens txv screen txv you know whatever it happens to be and build you know a, a system of work like a procedure on how you're going to do it okay and you have to kind of stick to it even if like right now everything screams to me that more than likely the TXV screen is the problem. Why don't I just jump and do that? Because there's been countless times where if I did that, the rack would have went down as soon as I walked away or I wouldn't have found the issue. And so a lot of the times it's like, you gotta follow the procedure, even if you really know, you know, or even if you think you might know, because a lot of the times I think I know and I don't. Receive a sight glass over here, and we see it's all it's around 10%. Okay, so 10% is pretty good. And we're gonna come over here, and I hate these sight glasses so much, but these ones are a little odd. 
So you see how there's a line there, right? Sometimes you would think to yourself, oh, that's flashing. It could be a low load of refrigerant, but as far as I've been able to read these things, you wanna imagine that you're looking in on the pipe and then that pipe is a full column of refrigerant. That's a pretty decent way to think of it because a lot of the time you'll have like, it's almost like you're looking down on a river type of thing uh, with these awkward cockeyed sight glasses. And if you're confused on it, you can go over there and check the other rack as well and see if it has something similar to it. But anyway, so the refrigerant level looks good. So now I'm just gonna hook up my gauges quick. We're gonna check that filter dryer. So this is now hooked up to this filter dryer. I took off these caps, turn that open a little bit, turn this one open a little bit. We're getting 149, 150. Okay, that's nothing. It's like half a PSI. They're good to go, that's fine. That's probably just from just, you know, even might even be my gauges aren't calibrated right or just a delay, but that is perfectly fine. Um, PSI drop across this thing, it's almost equal. And if we come over here, even our sight glass is cleared now that more refrigerant has starting to flow. And now also while I'm here, I'm just looking at that condenser, making sure it's not plugged. You know, just doing all these little things while I'm doing it. Now, why, some of you might say, hey, if you think it's a TXV, then why are you up here doing this? Because let me tell you, so I have, I mean, I think it's a TXV screen, sorry. And it's because I know that this particular chain has an issue with 30 TXV screens. The system runs warm and uh, it creates a lot of debris that gets into the system, okay? And some of you might be thinking, well then why are you wasting your time with this? Because I remember when I was a wee little technician, when I first started, I was in a store and I would cut out, I was basically the filter dryer executor. I would cut out filter dryers on the regular all the time and I was convinced, I'm like, ah, filter dryers, no one's doing this because no one wants to do it because it's a cruddy job. You know, I was convinced. I was like, you know, a titan amongst the men that went and did the job no one wanted to do. Well, I just never checked the filter dryer or if there was gas in the system. And there, I cut out a lot of filter dryers and wasted a lot of time that I could have been better spent actually fixing things if I just check this stuff like man it takes you like 10 minutes to do and it filled the dryers like three hours of work you know hauling everything up to the roof or depending on where you're doing it so just take the 10 minutes because if this has a clog it's not gonna flow your refrigerant to the floor to your floor correctly and then your filter dryer your txvs everything is going to show you that it has something wrong with it because it's not getting proper refrigerant you can only troubleshoot a case if you know it's getting proper refrigerant okay so that's why we're checking this stuff so now we're going to move on to the rack we're going to make sure all the compressors are okay there's no oil safeties or nothing and then we're going to move to if there's a CDS valve or solenoid valve. So we're just gonna keep going. My pressures are good, so the chance of this having an issue is like nothing, but I just make sure there's no oil failures on any of these things. They're all filled with oil. They look like they're doing okay. So everything looks okay on the compressor side. I'm gonna go over there and uh, see if there's valves over there or for the loop system. So I'm hooked up down here, crack that open. Okay, so you can see F4. This side is coming, it's returning from the case. Okay, so you can see that liquid line in there that goes, this, this liquid line down there. So that liquid line right there goes out to the cases, feeds through the TXVs, goes to the EVAP, and then the EVAP comes back this way, goes back through here, falls that header and goes into the back of those compressors. So I just want to make sure, so this is 26, Coil. That's what it's targeting, EVAP 26, a 404A refrigerant, right? A 64 PSI. So that's our reference when we get down there and check the case. Now this is what I expected to see. I didn't expect to see any problem. Why? Because it's only one case, right? It's one isolated side that seems to be having an issue. So it stands the reason that all the other ones are working right and this controls all the other ones. So anyway, 
Now we're going to go down and we're going to get case, case specific. So if we didn't have a CDS valve or you, you know, this, this is a CDS valve. It's a type of EPR, evaporator pressure regulator, okay? If it had a, a liquid line solenoid, you would check that. Or if it had, let's say, a suction stop, you could check that as well. You just wanna make sure the device that activates the flow of refrigerant is working correctly. So now that we know that, we know that we have enough refrigerant, that our pressures are right, and that our device that sends refrigerant to the case is working. So we're gonna now go down and check the case. So as you can see, temperature one, 53, temperature two, 53. They've been sitting there about five minutes. Temperature is here, temperature one, temperature two is over there. They're on two different sides of this screen here. So if the screen was clogged, um, you know, the, the refrigerant's coming in this way, on this side, it would be a much lower temperature. Um, for me, typically, like if I see something like three to anywhere up above three to four degrees, I start to take concern with it. Um, so that's like a rule of thumb. It just depends on your case and how volatile the system is and blah, 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 blah. But anyway, so you would do the same thing if it was a filter dryer. This case, it just happens to be a screen. So now I'm gonna take the superheat um, and see what that's going to give me. So you can see right now also I have pressures hooked up 66 degrees, which is a 27 EVAP, which is okay. 182 um, liquid pressure, which is okay. So anyway, I'm going to look down here and I'm going to see, you know, I hooked up my temperature probe at the end of the coil right before the TXV ball. You can hook it up after if you want. And we're going to take uh, superheat. So my gauges do superheat. Um, so you know, it's going to take a couple minutes to really get in accurately, but right now it's saying about 5.6 degrees of superheat. So even the superheat seems to be okay right now, but we're just going to let it for a couple minutes. And also we're going to, you know, we're going to take a look at, you know, this case up here and what these case specs seem to say about superheat. You can see right on here, it says evaporator 26, uh, superheat 6 to 8. So... Anyway, we have this 6 to 8, so right now we're at 5, so that seems to be alright. So we're just uh, going to keep plugging forward and keep looking. So you can see right now the superheat's hovering around 6. So the superheat is good to go. So now I'm going to check, and I should have checked it earlier, and check the temperature probe too. And I'm also going to graph out the way that this pulls temperature. So alright, we're going to go to circuits, right? Now that we're up here, we're going to go page down, and we're going to go and we're going to look. So F4. As always, enter. And we look and we can see 37. Wow. That's uh, that's not right. Right? So it should be about 32 or 33. So this temperature probe is almost 5 degrees too warm, right? So what I'm actually going to do is I'm actually going to graph. So I hit this menu button there. I'm going to come up here. We're going to go down to status, enter. And we're going to go down to graphs and logs, enter. And then we're gonna go to user selected point graphs, enter. Okay, and we're gonna, area number one, we're gonna look it up, okay? We're just gonna hit enter on that because that's the only thing that we can look up. Application, we're gonna look this up with F4, okay? Go down the page down, hit page down a couple times until we see the one that we want in there, which is F, you know, F4 again, I guess, technically. So we're gonna have this standard circuit right there, F4, enter. Now we're gonna go over again to our property. We're gonna go down, hit look up again with the F4, case temperature one, enter. And now we're gonna do the same exact thing that we just did, but we're gonna do case temperature two. down yeah, I think this is gonna be a lesson in assumptions today right so I learned that you know I was really thought it was the TXV screen because uh, case temperature two because that's a typical problem with the store and then we're gonna hit F1 for graphs typical problem with the store and uh, it seems like we're gonna zoom in with F5 now and then I'm gonna hit over a couple times. 
you know, and I really thought to myself, oh, TXV screen makes sense. And I was even trying to kind of stretch it like, okay, it still could be feeding. It still could have proper superheat. Typically, it wouldn't have proper superheat, but it's possible, right? And here I am trying to, you know, <laughs> swing it any way I can to make it be what I think it should be. And uh, it's a temperature probe. And uh, if we look at here, we can see that it's always kind of separated by five degrees. And when the defrost hits, this is, if not more, it goes down just as aggressively. And it just seems like it's perfectly mirrored by that other temperature probe. It's just five degrees warm. So I would say that's a pretty good. So if it was the TXV screen, we would see it go up for defrost. And then we would see a very long drawn out little trail. So I think that that's proven that that's the temperature probe. Well, this is also a lesson in sticking to your system because typically I have a system and uh, typically airflow is like the first thing I do and then I do a quick look at the rack and then I almost always check my temperature probe. And today I forgot because I was so fixated on the TXV. So we're gonna go to my truck and get a probe. So as you can see, I just used some crimp connectors on there and I put this plug in there. This is an Emerson CPC 0921 uh, temperature probe. Uh, so let's see again, Emerson, there's another number on there, 501-1121C. So this is in a cup of ice water, so this should be approximately 32 and a half to 33 degrees. I always put it one degree warm because I just do. Anyway, I'm gonna go check it and then contact the monitoring company and have them change it to be where it needs to be. So you can see now that that is um, 34 degrees. So that's not too bad. I'm still gonna call the monitoring company, have them offset it by one and a half. 33, uh, yeah, one and a half degrees. I want it to be around 33. So a lot of people, they do with 32. 32 is fine to do because remember, ice is 32 degrees. And then you put it in water and the water will come down to the temperature of the ice, which is around 32 degrees. But you know, you got all this whole like what was in the ice, what materials were in the ice, was it, you know, if you have a little bit of salt in the ice and it's really 31, if you have more, you know, hard materials in the ice, it could be 33, blah, 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 blah. so I just do 33. 33 is good. And then, you know, n most things don't get harmed by being a little bit colder. So now I had them actually change it by three degrees. Why? Because it was having this variability a little bit where it would go up to like 35, 36 and go back down. And so now it's in a cup of ice water, it's 31 and a half and it's kind of fluctuates to 32 and a half. And I think that that's just because, you know, it, it uses the resistance of those little metal probes to kind of go across and you know little temperature variations and all that and this thing's trying to provide real-time updates anyway so I called them up had them set it to there so now it's matching all the other probes should be good to go um, so you know we know proper airflow uh, pro refrigerant in our system no clog in the filter dryer no clog in the screen in the case the superheat is correct the pressures are correct and the only thing we found wrong was the temperature probe so we replace that I'm guessing we shouldn't have these alarms anymore it should be good to go three caveats here right at the end so first off for the for the hand valve down here okay uh, case hand valves you can piggyback that on to airflow in the beginning okay that's completely fine to do completely okay um, probably save you time actually so maybe that should even be updated in the list but I'm gonna put this list in the description below caveat number two okay I forgot to mention I just wanted to mention it somewhere okay is that this receiver level okay if you have low refrigerant and you troubleshoot your case your case is gonna come up that your filter dryer is no good, that your superheat's no good, like everything in the case is going to be to show you that it's wrong, okay, if you don't have enough refrigerant. And I just wanted to try to make that as clear as possible because I've written up a lot of things, unfortunately, that realistically it was just low on charge. So charge is so huge, I just wanted to draw attention to that in the end. And then the last one I wanted to draw attention to 
was this um, pressure at the cases. So I gave the example of piping size. That was just an example. There are countless reasons why you wanna take pressure at the case. All you know for certain is that the case pressure is not right. And now you can address that. So it could be that maybe you didn't check your your um, your EPR or your suction line solenoid correctly. You know, maybe you didn't, you know, you didn't do that. I don't know, okay? It could be something like that. And I just wanted to say that, okay, it's not only for piping size. It could be EPR size. It could be all kinds of things. It could be a restriction, okay? It could be even that you have a suction line filter dryer, okay, that you didn't check. Okay, and that's part of the case filter dryers. Sometimes they have suction line filter dryers, especially on single condensing units. Just wanted to add that in there. Now I'm gonna close this out here. Thanks for watching and everything. I hope you found it beneficial. I hope you learned a thing or two about a thing or two. And as always, like, subscribe, and all that good stuff. Uh, comment below what you learned. Comment anything you wanna see or whatever. And uh, that's how you do it, and have a good one.